On this Tuesday night, the latest explanation of three of those flying objects. There's no need to panic. The White House now says they may have been harmless. How the Prime Minister is responding and the difficulty recovering them. As rescues become more rare in Turkey, concerns mount for the health of the people left homeless. Much needed remedies for Canada's ailing health care system. It truly is a crisis. Atlantic Canada's innovative prescriptions. And the state funeral for a firecracker mayor. And she was always, always right. Honoring the incomparable Hurricane Hazel McCallion. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the latest information emerging about the three objects shot from the sky over Canadian and American airspace by American fighter jets. We still don't know what they were. And now the White House says the leading explanation is they may have been harmless and had nothing to do with espionage or intelligence gathering. These could be uh, tied to commercial or research entities and benign. Parts of the first object that was spotted, the one that was identified as a Chinese spy balloon, have been recovered after it was shot down off the coast of South Carolina. U.S. authorities say it carried equipment that was clearly for intelligence surveillance. The other three mystery objects, said to be different in size and shape, still haven't been recovered, and no photos of them have been released. The White House says they were shot down out of an abundance of caution, but if they really were harmless, was shooting them down an overreaction. Mackenzie Gray has our top story tonight. It's the biggest recovery yet. Key electronics from the Chinese spy balloon, including up to 12 meters of the antenna, found off the coast of South Carolina. We know that our defense and intelligence departments are analyzing every piece of this. Any debris from the other suspected balloons, thought to be the size of a car, shot down over Lake Huron, Alaska and Yukon, yet to be recovered. But the search for the debris facing deep water and frigid temperatures. We have deployed a number of aircraft to assist in that recovery effort. I want to indicate that the terrain is extremely rugged. It is extremely remote. The Lake Huron shootdown required two missiles from a U.S. fighter jet. On the fourth one over Lake Huron, first shot missed, uh, second shot hit. In this case, the missiles uh, land, or the missile. Uh, landed harmlessly in the water of Lake Huron. The origins for the three UFOs starting to become more clear. The White House saying they're likely commercial objects that did not come from a foreign government or a spy agency. There's strong consideration that these uh, objects are indeed benign. Americans believe the balloon. The Prime Minister non-committal on if he agrees with the American assessment. There's a, a range of different balloons uh, who, that seem to be uh, in Including different sizes and different different numbers. So they have cause to be annoyed with this. But the former head of CSIS believes it's premature to take any explanation off the table. If it's too early for us to say it's military, it's also too early for us to say it's civilian. We either know or we don't know. So I think we need to keep all of our options open. NORAD announced this afternoon that it turned its attention away from balloons and back onto what it traditionally does, Donna when on Monday they intercepted Russian fighter jets and bombers off the coast of Alaska. Okay, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister was in Ukraine today. Melanie Jolie met with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky as he pushes for more support for his country's fight against Russia. In a statement, Zelensky said the two discussed further security and defense cooperation and that Canada's support of the Ukrainian army is invaluable. While that meeting was happening, NATO defense ministers gathered in Brussels. The head of NATO says almost one year since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, there are no signs Russian President Vladimir Putin is preparing for peace. On the contrary. And as Crystal Gamansing reports, NATO members are being asked to ramp up production of ammunition and military equipment. What's that? You see? Ukraine's defense minister shared something close to his heart with the cameras. His country's wish for fighter jets. A light moment in a high-stakes, high-profile gathering of allies. The Kremlin is still betting that it can wait us out. The contact group, a side event for defense ministers meeting in Brussels, where allies listen to what Ukraine needs to battle against invading Russian forces and decide what can be provided. Donations, the Kremlin says, are dragging out the conflict and raising the possibility of further escalation. 
NATO and its partners, however, say support for Ukraine will not stop. It is important from a Canadian perspective to continually put on the table any aid we possibly have. Germany, which allowed countries including Canada to send Leopard 2 tanks, is also coming to the table with more. It signed a contract to restart production of ammunition for the Gepard anti-aircraft guns, ensuring it could keep supplying Ukraine. Ammunition supplies in general are a critical need in this war. In Ukraine, there's heavy shelling along the front line in the east, part of a brutal Russian campaign that has seen invading forces gaining ground around Bakhmut. This Ukrainian soldier says Russian artillery and mortar attacks have increased from one to nearly ten a day. American experts say talk of Russia launching a new massive attack using fighter jets appears to just be talk, but some kind of spring offensive is anticipated. U.S. Army General Mark Milley, however, outright dismisses Russia. Russia has lost. They've lost strategically, operationally, and tactically. But Russia is still pushing ahead, forcing Ukraine to keep fighting. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Ukraine's neighbor Moldova closed its airspace at one point today and scrambled fighter jets after a balloon-like object was spotted near its border with Ukraine. Once authorities determined there was no threat, air traffic resumed. Moldova has repeatedly accused Russia of plotting to destabilize the former Soviet Republic. The president, Maya Sandu, claims Moscow has plans to use foreign saboteurs with military background to overthrow her pro-European government. And last week, Vladimir Zelensky said Kyiv had intercepted plans by Russian security services to destroy Moldova. The Kremlin rejects the accusations. In Turkey and Syria, the heartache continues and the death toll keeps rising. More than 40,000 people are now known to have died in the earthquakes. And after more than a week, finding survivors is increasingly rare. It is the dead that are being recovered. In Turkey, the body of a Canadian woman has been found. Samar Zora was found under the rubble of a five-story building in the city of Antakya. The 33-year-old PhD candidate had traveled to the city for her research in anthropology. The next phase is recovery and relief, though, as Mike Armstrong reports, all hope is not lost. Days have now stretched into more than a week, and somehow survivors are still being found. This was a man and woman pulled out of a building by rescuers Tuesday evening. Earlier, it was two women pulled from another building. But after more than 200 hours trapped, they are alive, but barely. The celebrations are more and more subdued, and they are fewer and fewer. According to reports, there were only seven rescues on this day in a country where tens of thousands are still missing. The survivor spent his day outside the collapsed building where his niece lived with her seven roommates. He says he's checked hospitals and crews have gone through the debris. Not a trace has been found, he says. There's absolutely no news. Searches are being called off in some areas as hope fades. Rescue efforts now turn to recovery. According to the World Health Organization, one million people in Turkey have been left homeless and infrastructure damage affects millions more. Many don't have access to clean water or sanitation. It's a great concern and it uh, increases the risk of uh, waterborne diseases. Crews are bringing down dangerous buildings. It's a delicate process, as is organizing disaster relief. Team Rubicon, a veteran-led disaster relief group, has a small team on the ground preparing for a larger deployment. But it says too many groups arriving too early can be a problem. The World Health Organization and the Turkish Ministry of Health and their government will determine when we deploy, what we deploy to do, and um, where we'll go. Tent cities are being built, but many are still in the streets. This family is living in front of their damaged home. The mother says her children cry every day, and she tries to be strong for them. The Turkish government says about 42,000 buildings collapsed or are in urgent need of demolition. The region is also dealing with a mass exodus. More than 150,000 people have left southern Turkey, 
with more following. This man says he's moving west and starting from zero. He says he wouldn't wish what he's going through on anyone. Mike Armstrong, Global News. In Syria, more aid is now getting through after two more crossing points were opened up on the border with Turkey. Eleven relief trucks used one of those new routes today, carrying blankets, jerry cans and mattresses. The UN now says nearly nine million people in Syria have been affected by last week's earthquakes. More than 7,400 buildings in that country are completely or partially destroyed. The UN has launched a $397 million funding appeal for Syria, calling it one of the worst disasters in recent memory. The human suffering from this epic natural disaster should not be made even worse by man-made obstacles. Access, funding, supplies. Aid must get through from all sides to all sides through all routes without any restrictions. The UN says the funding would benefit nearly 5 million people with the most urgent humanitarian needs over the next three months. New Zealand has declared a state of emergency after Cyclone Gabrielle swept through the northern parts of that country. More rain fell in a 24-hour period than New Zealand usually gets in the entire month of February. Landslides and floods have blocked major roads. Fallen trees have smashed houses. More than 200,000 people are without power. The military is now helping with evacuations and the distribution of essential supplies in the hardest hit areas. The derailment of a train in Ohio on February 3rd still has residents there concerned about the hazardous and toxic chemicals it was carrying. People in East Palestine, Ohio, have been told they don't need to be concerned about air quality. About 50 of the 150 train cars went off the tracks. A number of them were carrying toxic and carcinogenic chemicals. They caught fire and burned for days. Evacuation orders were issued to about 5,000 people and controlled detonations were done to release the chemicals, but concerned residents have raised questions about lingering smells, dead fish and chickens, plus possible long-term health effects. In a press conference today, Ohio officials said air quality tests showed readings below safe levels. The first Republican to challenge Donald Trump for the nomination of the Republican Party has made it official. Nikki Haley, the former South Carolina governor and American ambassador to the UN, announced her plans to seek the nomination for the 2024 presidential election. Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of the last eight presidential elections. That has to change. Haley had said she would not challenge Trump for the Republican nomination. She now says it's time for generational change. She says what she calls the need for fiscal responsibility prompted her to run. If she wins the nomination and gets elected, she would be the first woman president and the first American president of Indian heritage. There are innovative and badly needed treatments coming up. What's being done in Atlantic Canada to help solve the health care crisis? We report so often on the gaps and the problems in Canada's health care system, but there are efforts underway to make improvements. Ross Lord reports on some of the innovations in Atlantic Canada that are already making a difference for patients. As health care outcomes become more tragic, more often, finding ways to improve the system has become a desperate pursuit. It, it truly is a crisis. You know, people really are struggling to receive care as a patient. Some innovations are coming from Atlantic Canada, where an older population creates more urgency for change. Newfoundland and Labrador has started flying cardiac patients from remote regions into St. John's for some procedures, then back to their home communities on the same day. By doing that, we avoided the requirement for a bed. And these days, beds in hospitals are more precious than gold. Newfoundland health leaders say their program is a first in Canada. It puts patients first patients and their families. It brings care to them, kind of on their own terms, quicker without waiting around in a hospital bed and being transported here and, and stuck in hospital for days. As other strategies emerge, like Ontario expanding more private delivery of public health care, there are efforts to streamline the disjointed flow of information. Sometimes when I'm seeing the patient in front of me, I don't even have access uh, to the most recent visit. And so it's frustrating, you don't have access to real-time data. 
Leisha Hawker is the president of Doctors Nova Scotia. She applauds the province's announcement. It will spend $365 million over 10 years to establish a single digital information card on each patient. Every doctor and every allied health professional will have access to real-time data uh, that will be accurate and uh, it will just be so much more streamlined that uh, physicians and nurses will be able to focus more on the patients. Nova Scotia is catching up to provinces that already use real-time data. But supporters say when it's up and running in a couple of years, the system will help heal fractures in a system where there's less margin for error than ever before. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. Cutting costs ahead, how rising food prices are forcing families to be more frugal. Inflation in the U.S. has dropped just a touch, not as much as many economists had predicted. New numbers released today by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics show inflation came down to 6.4 percent from 6.5 percent in December. The cost of living went up by 0.5 percent as the price of food, gas and shelter continue to rise. The slowdown came largely from one sector of the consumer price index, used cars. The price of used vehicles was soaring at this time last year and is now down by almost 12 percent year over year. Here at home, a new report has found one in five children in Manitoba are living in poverty. That is the highest rate of any province in Canada. The report's authors say the increasing cost of food and higher interest rates mean more families are struggling, especially Indigenous families. Melissa Ridgen traveled to a remote Manitoba First Nation where those ballooning prices are forcing families to make hard decisions. This is like me for the month. Starts at 1800 While many across the country are making tough choices to stretch dollars. I'm happy that's only once a month because if it's every two weeks, like my truck payment, I would probably be crying. Chantel Green survives with more money going out than coming in. She manages her band's car wash and laundromat. Getting around here means a truck is a necessity. And an expensive one. Okay. Going down. With my gas tank now, it's really a struggle. Yeah. Anywhere from like a quarter tank to half a tank, it cost me from 50 to $100. Don't forget your shopping bag. Let's go get some coffee creamer. Do you think we need anything else? Fisher River Cree Nation and nearby Pegwas First Nation have two main grocery stores to choose from. They're three hours from the convenience of shopping around for sales like many in the cities get to do. Staff at one of the grocers says that he feels awful every time he puts out ever increasing price stickers knowing that so many are struggling. This is typically what my freezer looks like. The only reason this bottom half is filled is because we received a meat pack from our band this Christmas. For Green, the struggle is that feeding her daughter means not feeding herself. With uh, two adults in the house, we made the sacrifice thing. Okay, we could sacrifice meat, we could sacrifice milk. There you go. Sacrifices she feels have taken a toll on their health. I definitely think so because my dad is a renal cancer patient who is also a diabetic. My diet is horrible. I pretty much eat canned, like stuff out of canned foods or stuff you'd find in the freezer section. The fruits I buy, vegetables, I try to make sure I get them into my dad. The only way she can get protein and vegetables into Shantae is this certain name brand soup. With rising costs and no end in sight, she focuses on the positive, that her situation isn't as bad as some. I've been preparing for this my whole life, kind of, in a way. Could I get that receipt? Melissa Ridgen, Global News, Fisher River Cree Nation. Remembering Hurricane Hazel next, celebrating the life of one of Canada's most memorable mayors. How do you say goodbye to a woman who is larger than life and served in public life for decades? Well, Hazel McCallion was honored with a state funeral today on what would have been her 102nd birthday. She knew so many people, touched so many lives, and was known as the matriarch of Mississauga. As Mike Drolet reports, they turned out today to say farewell. Anybody who ever met Hazel McCallion for more than a minute knows she wouldn't want a somber state funeral. After all, we're talking about Hurricane Hazel. It's a big fish, looks like a shark. Who in her 90s had to be held down by the late Rob Ford so the fish she was reeling in wouldn't pull her overboard. And what a fish that was. 
The people of Mississauga have spoken tonight. It was clear from that day in 1978, Mississauga had elected a firecracker as mayor, someone who would transform the cow pastures of suburban Toronto into the seventh largest city in Canada. Hazel never hesitated to say what was on her mind, not for a second. And she was always, always right. She faced adversity early on when a train derailment and subsequent chemical fire forced the evacuation of 200,000 of her constituents. Her leadership during that crisis cemented her tough reputation and could have opened doors to provincial or federal politics if she had been interested. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau joked she would have bristled at following party orders. My father and I weren't the only prime ministers to wonder how great but challenging she might have been as a minister before realizing it was most likely a bit of a moot point. We probably would have ended up as ministers serving in her cabinet. Even until the very end, she was a force of nature. Former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien says he never thought he would retire before Hazel. We kind of agreed that we should leave together. So when I quit at 70, she called me to give me hell. <laughs> what happened to you? As Hazel, compared to you, I'm a chicken. So I'm gone. She was small, yet mighty. She outlasted her contemporaries in politics and those who followed as well. Today would have been her 102nd birthday. It's somewhat surprising she's not still here. Mike Trelay, Global News, Toronto. And we leave you tonight with some moments from Hazel McCallion's time as mayor, a trailblazer for women in politics who left her mark on Mississauga and across the country. That is Global National for this Tuesday. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.